No, I got it. I'm good. single door on the basketball hoop over there. Um, just go in that door to the left, you'll find the bathrooms. We don't have our North Star sign to guide you this time, but it is over there. Now, first announcement for today, uh, we need childcare volunteers for this summer. Uh, coming up, there's gonna be some people who normally do it, we're out of town, and we're a little bit low on volunteers, so if you're at all interested, if you like hanging out with kids, if you want to do parents and here a favor, um, you're gonna see these slips, they're on each row. You can go ahead and sign up on there, you can pass them down the rows to people, or you can also contact me or Megan or any of the pastors and we can get you signed up for that. It would be super appreciated, I'm sure, by the parents in here. Second announcement, if last week you were here and you remember this form that kind of had some information on what we were talking about last week, there's more of those forms in the back. We found out we didn't print enough last week and there are some people who wanted more. So if you're interested in that, that's in the back over there. And uh, final announcement, if you are a parent of a middle schooler or high schooler, we are going to be having our summer camps again for middle school and high school this year. Uh, if you haven't heard the announcement yet or haven't gotten the email yet, you can let me know. I have dates for both middle school and high school for that. We'd love to get your students signed up for that. It's no cost to you guys, just a couple of days up in Shingletown. Should be a lot of fun. So to uh, start our service off this morning, as you can see, I've kind of had an interesting week with my leg here. Um, and it's funny that we're talking about anger this week because it's kind of frustrating when you break your foot and don't exactly know how. It's a little bit confusing <laughs> and frustrating. Especially when you're like me and you like going out and doing things and then you're kind of stuck on a couch. So it's been, it's been a weird week. And I noticed as I was kind of sitting there kind of being frustrated, being angry, I noticed it just wasn't good because I'm just sitting and thinking about it all the time. So I started going through this book of guided prayers that I got from Caleb a while back. And I noticed something bizarre about it that I hadn't noticed before when I've gone through it in the past. There's this one phrase in the book that's repeated in every single guided prayer. And I hadn't really thought about it at all until this week about why it is repeated every single time. But the phrase is, silence, be still, and aware of God's presence within and all around. Silence, be still, and aware of God's presence within and all around. Now, it jumped out at me because I thought, I'm not always aware of God in everything around me and within me all the time. And so as I'm sitting there in my house, I started thinking about it and looking around. And first thing I notice is I'm in a house. That's something to be grateful for. I have shelter, I have a place that I can live and I can rest. And I was grateful for that. I start looking around, thinking a little bit more, and I see my cats running around attacking the couch for no reason. And I thought, how cool is it that God created this like weird little animal that we get to hang out with and have fun with? And then why the dogs do if you're a dog person? I like both. Then I noticed, or I started thinking about people in my life that I care about, my family, my wife, all you guys. Started thinking about how God is at work and the conversations we have with each other, the relationship we're in with each other. And I was grateful for that. I look outside my front window and there's this big tree out in front of my house. And I noticed about half the branches were dead, about half of them had these bright green leaves on them. And I just started thinking, like, it's interesting how this tree can have stuff that's dead in it, but it can also have new life coming out of it in the spring. And anyway, as I started thinking about this, what does it mean to be still and aware of God's presence? It's having this keen eye that... Even in a time that was frustrating for me, and I felt like I was just bored out of my mind, I was able to start looking around and taking inventory of 
where God is at work in my life, what God is doing for me, what God has created, the metaphors he creates in nature that even in us there's stuff that's broken but new life is still possible with him. And I started being more and more aware of what God was doing even in the time that was frustrating for me. So I'd love this morning to just open us up in prayer and just ask for an awareness of God in our life. An awareness of his presence in everything that we do and everything that we are and everyone that we're with. Lord, help us to see you. I know we say that a lot. I know that we look for you in things like church and in our worship. But God, help us to see you in everything. Help us to see the ways that you're at work in our hearts. Help us to see the ways that you're at work in our friends and our family. Help us to see the ways that you're at work in the world around us. In a world that can be confusing or frustrating or strange, God, help us to see you and to see you clearly. Lord, give us that awareness this week in everything that we do as we go to our jobs and different people and different life situations. Things that are good, things that are bad, things that are neutral. God, help us to see you, to see your hands, to see your heart and all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. No? Um, Thank you. So, uh, I'm going to be leading y'all in worship today. And I had asked Dave what kind of songs I should pick for this since we're talking about angry. And he said, pick some really angry songs. <laughs> there are no really angry worship songs. <laughs> I tried. I couldn't find any. Thanks for trying. So, as I was pondering, you know, what music to choose, I was trying to think about what makes me angry. I mean, there's lots of things that makes me angry, but what really makes me angry? And one of the things that I really had to focus on this week was being inconvenienced. I get really angry when I'm inconvenienced because I'm not doing what I want to do. And therefore, I'm very self-centered. <laughs> and I really discovered that a lot about myself. And so I was like, okay, Lord, for me personally, as I'm choosing this music, um, how can I take inconvenience, anger, self-centeredness and point it, and point it away from you and, you know, fixing my eyes on, on you and not on myself. And so I just prayed about the music and um, some of these are oldies, but this is a good song. This is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And I feel like that's a good place to start to get out of yourself and, and towards God.
And now I'm fully in touch with it. <laughs> no, I can't wait. It's going to be fun. I think like that, that grandpa gene kicked in, I think, five, six, seven years ago. And I've been just waiting. <laughs> it's happening. So I'm very excited. Okay, that has nothing to do with today's uh, topics. We are starting this series, a little three-part series that God kind of laid on my heart. I know that's a phrase you hear. I don't usually use that phrase very often. I can't think of any other way to describe it. I just just felt like I really want to talk about these these three um, emotions, these three what, negative emotions or whatever, anger, fear, and shame. So we're calling it the good gift of bad emotions. <laughs> Because these three just have, well, they're strange. We're going to see it's hard to describe. If I ask you, are they good or are they bad, it's a hard question to answer. Um, but people have been asking, well, why? 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 What prompted you to want to do this, to talk about this? And some thought, you know, like, did something happen or, or whatever? And you, you could point to the last five years and kind of a wider culture easily and say, well, there's been a lot of anger out there. There's been a lot of fear out there, right? Politically, pandemics, you know, country, world, whatever, fires. Um, and shame, that's a big thing. Uh, there's a lot of cancel culture going on out there, a lot of shaming going on. But that's actually not really what motivated you. What we're going to talk about definitely will apply to all that. Um, I'm really thinking more, it, this just grows out of years and years and years of watching People struggle with these these three in particular. Um, I'm really speaking, the, the principles we're going to look at, um, they apply far and wide and all over the place, but what I want you to be thinking in your minds is more your interpersonal relationships, okay? Particularly, and actually, your more mundane ones, your day-to-day -day ones, the ones you have with your, your spouse or, or a roommate or your kids or your parents or friends or co-workers, the people you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. That's really what I'm talking about because this is really the warp and woof of our lives. And um, what I watch, what I experience, not just in counseling people, but just people going through life, we're experiencing these three emotions several times a day. And sometimes we don't acknowledge it. But these emotions, as we're gonna see, they're really important but they also get us into trouble. And so if we don't understand how to navigate these things, um, then life doesn't go well. And that's the thing about these three emotions. The good gift of bad emotions. If I ask you, you know, is anger good or bad? Is fear good or bad? Is shame good or bad? It's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, what I'm hoping to do in the next three weeks is rehabilitate your understanding of these three emotions, these three words. There's a good reason why we think they're bad, by the way. So there is a sense in which they are bad. Two, in particular. One is they just feel bad. Like, nobody wants to feel these things. Feeling angry, feeling shame, feeling fear. If you could live the rest of your life without ever having to feel them again, I'm sure you would like that. <laughs> Nobody likes to feel these things. So that's one reason why we call them bad. The other reason why we call them bad is because we all know in our own lives and watching people around us that we see bad things coming out of these emotions. Angry people go on and do often hurtful things, right? Shame is a very, very destructive force in people's lives. It leads to all kinds of bad stuff. And fear, living from fear, similarly causes people to make poor choices, okay? So we naturally want to say, therefore, they're bad. However, what I'm going to hopefully make the case is that it, the emotions themselves are not the problem. In fact, these are God-given. They're part of what it means for us to have emotions, that these emotions actually serve a good purpose. They're negative feelings that serve a positive purpose. And our problem is that we, we make mistakes with them. When they come and we feel them, it's, it's our problem that we then don't either not interpret them right or the way we respond to them, we respond to them poorly. And so what I hope to do is help us separate those out and figure out how to properly respond to them. What, what are they there for? Because they are there for a purpose. 
and then look at all the many ways, and there are many ways that we then get it wrong, and it leads to more pain, more destruction, and that sort of thing. So, to start off, the best way to understand all three, what we're doing, by the way, today is going to go a little longer than the next two, just because I've got to do an introduction and anger. We're going to do intro and anger, because you need to have an overview of the whole thing, but... Then we're going to zero in on anger in particular today. Then we'll do shame next week and we'll do a fear of the following. Oh, by the way, too, meant to mention that uh, there's a basketball game in here afterwards. Not a North State basketball game. Either. Like, you're not invited. <laughs> there's going to be a basketball game happening in here. So when we're done today, if, if I can pitch it again and, you know, get things put away, leave all that stuff in the back, set up the way it is. But we might need to kind of ski daddle. Um, there's a good word, ski down um, a little earlier. And we can take our talking outside and all that. Just wanted to warn you about that. So, the, the first thing you want to understand, the best way to think of these three emotions is that they are pain. Okay? They are emotional pain. And, and I'm not, that's not just a metaphor. That's really what they are. Just like physical pain, they serve the exact same purpose. They're just the emotional version of a physical pain. Pain serves a purpose. If I said to you, uh, is pain good or bad, you'd be faced with the same, like, how do I answer that question? Most of us want to say pain is bad, right? Because it hurts. But you ask a doctor, you ask a scientist, and they will tell you, no, no, pain is actually good. It might hurt, but it's good. In fact, there's a condition called, uh, it's called CIP. It's a very rare um, Congenital condition, congenital insensitivity to pain. There are a rare number of people who are born without the ability to feel pain. And you might think, well, that sounds like a wonderful life. It's an awful life. These people's lives are terrible. They, they can't sense pain. By the time they hit their teens and 20s, most of them are in a wheelchair because they're just so battered up, their backs, their legs. And um, young men often who have this end up dead because they're, you know, they're young men, they're just doing crazy things and they get themselves, they literally get themselves killed because they can't feel pain. And many commit suicide because, again, by the time they're in their 20s, their life, the quality of their life is just so poor. Um, they have a miserable life because they don't experience pain. The way one doctor described it is this, he said, pain is incredibly important to the process of learning how to modulate your interaction with the world without doing damage to your body. Okay, so that's the purpose of pain. It allows you to interact with this world in a way that doesn't do damage to you. All you gotta do is change the language to apply the emotional pain. And you can say this, emotional pain is incredibly important to the process of learning how to modulate your interactions with others without doing damage to your soul or their soul. And so pain serves a purpose. Pain serves a purpose. But here's the problem with pain. Pain, obviously the purpose of it is to draw our attention to something, right? The problem is because it hurts, it draws our attention to the pain itself. And this is our first mistake. Our first mistake is that we focus in on the pain and not what the pain is trying to tell us. And so, pain is meant to point us to a problem, right? Pain is not the problem. Pain points us to the problem. And so it, it begs the question, what is the problem behind the pain? When you have a pain, then, you know, you should be looking for what's causing it. So real quickly, just a quick overview, and we're going to look into that some more. But just to give an overview of the three, what is the problem behind each of these pains? When I feel anger, it's when someone harms or fails me or harms or fails someone else. Okay, that's the basic. Now, you heard a few examples given here today of just stuff happening. You know, Connor was saying, it's like, I mean, somebody had come in and clubbed his leg and he got angry at them. He just woke up and, and his leg was hurting. And, but he mentioned, kind of made you a little angry, right? And then Kim was saying, you know, uh, inconveniences and like, just life not going well. Now that opens up another big subject of the subject of anger. Uh, we're not going to go so much into the angry at God part, but usually when you're sort of mad at the universe, um, if you really trail it back, it's we're just mad at God that's letting these things happen to us. 
But the point is this, with this one and shame, so anger is when I feel that someone has harmed or failed me. Shame is when I harm or fail someone else. These two are sort of justice oriented. We're going to unpack anger in a second some more. But they're like, the idea is that I thought things should have gone one way and they went another way. It's this sort of, this shouldn't have happened to me. So, but, but the, the, the relation between these two is anger is when you did something to me and shame is when I feel bad that I did something to you. Let's keep it simple. Also, you can be angry that this person is hurting that person. Okay. And then fear is just the anticipation of harm coming to someone, yourself or someone else. So and that's more generic. Um, but th this is what, these are the, just very generally speaking, this is what each of these things is trying to get your attention focused on these issues, okay? So, in a broken world, God uses these emotions, these negative emotions for this positive purpose. Fear is to keep us safe from getting hurt by things out there. And uh, the sh shame and anger are there to lead us to what is broken in others, that's anger, or what's broken in myself, that's shame. They're, they're, they're a way to get our attention so that we will look for uh, a brokenness out there in the world and in the person or in ourselves. That's their purpose, okay? Now, the problem is, and this is where we, we're just gonna hit one problem after another before we look at, well, what are you supposed to do with this? Um, We've got two ways, two inappropriate ways that we respond to the, these emotional pains. And if you have to think about it, they're like, you know, Dave, I'm always talking about one extreme and the other extreme and then the, the, the balance in the middle. One extreme is that we sort of run from the pain. We try to get too, we try to create distance between us and the pain because it hurts. And the other extreme is more of a we embrace it too close. Okay, if you just want to think about it in two different buckets. One is we get we, we, we run too much distance, the other is too close. So let's look at what happens. And in both cases, the mistake is that we're making the pain the point. And we're not looking for the problem behind the pain. Okay, so on the one side, when we think pain is the problem, what do we do? What do you do if you think, here, I have participation. If you think the pain is the issue, what do you do? Pain killers. Run pain pills. He said pain pills, right. Uh, or run. You could give a whole list of things. So you go into pain management mode. And that involves avoidance, that's run. Pills, that's pain killing. So we have all these ways in which we basically try to just, you know, take a sharpie and make the pain go away. And we literally, even with emotional pain, we will literally take pills or something. We'll, we'll do things to try to make the pain go away. Uh, but what's the problem with this? If this is all you do? It just masks it. What? The, problem's still there. the problem is still there. The problem persists. If you want to be alliterative, the problem persists. <laughs> so, problem's still there. It's still generating that pain up underneath. This whole thing is a problem that starts generating other pain and other stuff. It just kind of, you're only making things worse. And we're going to see how that works when it comes to anger. So that's one way we do it. We just do pain management, don't deal with the problem. The other thing that we do is we go the other way, and that is we put pain in control of our response. This is sort of a, an identification with the pain. It's, it's we, and again, we'll see each one how that looks, but very simply, it's we act from it. We sort of dwell in the pain, and we act from it, and when we act out from that pain, guess what happens? It, it, it hits other people, and we pretty much cause harm to them, which, guess what, multiplies the pain. And so, it goes from, like, I'm angry about such and such to, I'm just angry. Now I just, I'm an angry person. Or, I'm, I'm ashamed that I this to, I live in shame. Or, I'm afraid of the snake. That's legit. But then there's, I'm just a fearful person. You know, I'm afraid of the dark. There might be snakes or bears out there. I don't know what they are, but I'm just fearful. And now it impedes the way I live my life. Notice what happens when you do this is, as you hit these other people, you're going to get those, the, 
those emotional responses are not going to happen inside them. So, you know, uh, my anger causes anger or shame or pain into somebody else. And, and it just keeps multiplying it. All right. So, <coughs> negative feelings and emotional pain. Pain's not the problem. Pain points to the problem. So this takes us around full circle that we want to get to the problem behind it. We want to ask the question when we're angry, why am I angry? When I'm ashamed, why am I ashamed? When I'm fearful, what am I afraid of? And then the second question, once you try to get to the why, is well, what do I do about it? If you found the problem, then there's a question of response. And so what we want to do now is we want to look um, at the specific one, anger. Anger. Anger, anger, anger. Um, anger is like, it's good to think of all these emotions as like gauges or lights on, a, on the dashboard of your car. Um, they're more like the lights, okay, and they blink different colors. <laughs> um, they're not really, they're actually not really good at doing this kind of thing, well they kind of are, but the problem with them, they're not accurate. But they do indicate there's a problem, and we're going to see that, that that's the problem with our emotions. Is that they're really good at telling us that there's a problem, but they're not really good at describing actually what the problem is. In fact, they can be very misleading on that count. But what is anger? Uh, anger is the negative emotional reaction you get when you see or experience an injustice. A uh, person getting harmed. Uh, like if you, if you watch a person walk down the street and then they tripped and fell and skinned their knee, you don't get angry. But if they're walking and, and you watch somebody trip them <laughs> and they fell, then you'd get angry. There's always, there's, there's always this personal element to it. Again, even when circumstances we don't like, like I said earlier, we, we, it's the personalization of it. And really what lies at the heart of anger is this idea of, of, of deserve. It's this, if it happens to me, if I'm angry about what's going on in my life, it's I didn't deserve this. I didn't do anything to deserve this. This should not have happened to me. And that's what produces the emotion, anger. It's a feeling of injustice, that, that this, should not have, this should not have happened. Um, and so that's sort of your basic thing. Our, our key verse then for today is this, Ephesians 4, 25 through 27. Let therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now this is a, a, a crucial scripture. It's great and it really the whole context there really helps us. That first verse really, really gives us uh, what's going to be the answer to the whole thing. Therefore, putting away falsehood, let everyone speak the truth to his neighbor for we're members of one another. What we're going to see is that it comes down to an issue of truth and falsehood. Um, the way we are going to have to handle, the way we inappropriately handle these emotions, or when we inappropriately respond to them, is always because of an issue of, of truth and falsehood. We're believing lies. So again, the gauge is telling you a general truth, there's a problem, but then we go off and we start believing stuff that isn't true, and, and, and that's when things spiral out of control and get worse. So see what I mean? I'll give you some examples. Um, so, but the point is, you're going to see this whole thing is wrapped in an issue of finding the problem. That's a truth exercise. Finding the doctors when you know he goes to the doctor. The doctor's engaged in a truth exercise. He's trying to figure out what caused this pain, so that he gives the right solution to it. It's not enough to just know it hurts. <laughs> it doesn't really do anything. Got to figure out why. Then it says, and this is, this is the best part of this thing, or you know, the one we like to quote: "Be angry, but sin not." And it's a great phrase because it captures the ambiguity of the emotion of anger. It doesn't say don't be angry, you know, stop being angry. It says be angry. But be careful, don't let this anger lead you into sin, because it has the potential to do that. And he goes on to say, don't let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil, because this is, this is how it looks. This, don't, you know, let the sun go down on your anger. I know this is not some legalistic rule, like if you have a conflict, you know, you must settle it before the end of the day. 
Uh, that's how I, you know, people play games with this, like, well, people, me. <laughs> when LaShawn and I were dating, I, I used to like to quote this. And look, like, look, my defense is I was only like two years out of the cult, right? So we still had a lot of, a lot of cult in me, okay? But I used to, if we had like a, some kind of disagreement, I was like, all right, don't let the sun go down on your anger, which was a great, it was my tactic, because I was a night owl. And I could, so I just kept the conversation going into the wee hours until she was so worn out. She'd lose every time because she just wanted to go home and go to sleep, you know? <laughs> and so, it's not appropriate, okay? It means, it's just an a idiomatic way of just saying, um, don't let it simmer. You know, deal with it. Don't bury it. Don't let it, don't sleep it under the carpet and let anger simmer. We're going to see in a moment what happens when you do that. It, what it does in this language is it gives the, the devil a foothold. It, it, it leads to, anger unattended leads to um, all kinds of worse damage than the, than the initial thing that caused it. This is why the warning is there. Be angry, but deal with it is what he's saying. Deal with it. Um, okay, so... Here's the, this is the truth exercise. Putting away falsehood, speaking truth, and this is truth speaking to yourself, and then of course, often to the person maybe that you're dealing with, that, you know, maybe that's where your anger came from. Uh, so step one is diagnosing the problem behind the pain of anger. How do you do that? You gotta ask, question number one is, it sounds stupid, but it's, am I angry? <laughs> Just asking, or stopping for a minute to ask yourself, am I angry? And you might think, well, that's dumb. Like, if you're angry, you're angry, right? Uh, you know, if you're happy, then you know, it's like, you know. Anyway. <laughs> and if you're angry, and you know, it's comfy. No. Um, it, we don't like, for some reason, well, there's reasons why we don't like to admit when we're angry. Just watch two people, especially if some two people are having a fight and one person says, well, you seem angry, or are you angry? What does the other person always says? I'm not angry, you know. Partly there's some games going on there, and that's why it does that. But we don't like to admit that we're angry. Now, I want to say something else. One reason we don't like to admit that we're angry, and this is me, and I'm sure it's a lot of people's, we, we, anger is, doesn't equal rage. All rage is anger, but not all anger is rage. So to, we, to get, you got to be really careful about this definition of anger. It doesn't mean you're raging, you're ready to you know, tear somebody's head off. It just means you have an emotion. It could be really small, but those small versions of it can be really insidious. Okay? They can do a lot of damage over time. We'll see in a minute. But it's just that feeling that, eh, I've been wronged. I've been wronged. Like, there's an injustice here. And it can, be, it can be very subtle. That's anger. Rage is just when that emotion is off the charts. You, you can't control yourself. So, you got to admit it. Uh, back in my 20s, if you asked me if I got angry, I would have said, I don't get angry. I never get angry. Um, you just get angry as you're dying. I just don't ever get angry. I honestly didn't think I ever got angry. Because I never raised my voice, I never did this, I, I didn't see the evidence of it, I didn't believe it. You asked me today, if I can, <laughs> it's, a, it's funny, I'm sitting here preparing this thing on anger, like, like a week ago Wednesday, I was angry at Everett, and then <laughs> this Monday, and Tuesday, I'll tell you about that in one second, and then uh, Monday, Tuesday, I was angry at a whole group of people, and I was quite angry. Uh, by let's see, Friday, I was angry at Sean. We were having a disagreement over car on the Costco. Um, angry enough that when we got into Costco, I just found that you know that spot where they got the, the big uh, per pergola, you know that thing, with the, you know the alcohol patio furniture. I didn't even go to the free food. I was so angry. I just sat there and thought. <laughs> so that tells you something right there. And then, and I was going to stop there, except that this morning I was angry at LaShawn again. You know, she was like, hey, you're going to be to buy a new cart. This, I broke the cart a couple of weeks ago. And she told me, buy the cart. I'm like, well, it's Everett's fault. He has, I, I told him to pick one out. So now I'm back angry at Everett. So it's just a full circle. <laughs> um, 
But seriously, I, I laugh, but truly, in each of those incidents, there was enough anger that I had to tend to it. Okay? In each one of those. And I am tending, or have tended to each of them. I think this morning was one I still need to do a little tending. Because <laughs> it just happened. Um, but, so now, now, you know, I've just become more aware, I guess. But we need to be able to admit it. I'm angry. And it doesn't mean you're evil, because you feel angry. It's what you do with it is, is really going to be the million dollar question. So, consciously admit it. Now, this is assuming you are angry, okay? If you are angry, you can go down, if you go down the denial path and you say, no, I'm not, then you're back to pain management, avoidance, painkillers, and, and all that. And let me show you what happens when you do this with anger. And I've watched this, particularly in couples, because of the long-term nature of that relationship. You see it with, in, in families, you see it in long-term relationships in particular. Um, untended anger, I call it the regression to the relational dark side. And if Caleb was up here, I'd have him imitate Yoda for me, because he does it way better than me. But I always think of Yoda when I do this regression, you know, Anger each to hate. No, hate each to the dark side. <laughs> 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 do it. You do it. Oh, God. Look at him do it. Next week. You're there next week. So, there is a progression. What happens is, it starts with disappointment. You get disappointed. Somebody doesn't come through. Something doesn't come through. Again, very normal. Number one, this is being human, living in a broken world. People will disappoint you, right? And there's nothing wrong with you getting some level of anger because you were disappointed. You, didn't, you haven't done anything wrong. This is normal. If you didn't get angry, then you don't have a pulse, right? Anger is what causes us to go and try to fix the world. You know, it means we care about injustice. But untended anger leads to resentment. Resentment is when you sort of buried it and time goes. It, it, this, you got to add time. So it means you're either dealing with the same person or the same offense over and over and you keep pushing it down, pushing it down. It starts to turn into this thing called resentment. Now, that's when you start using the words like in your head or out or with your mouth. You always, you never. That's a clear indication that there's resentment. You've started to build up um, now notice it's in yellow. I put it in yellow because when you get to the level of resentment, that's like a, a yellow light flashing on your dashboard. That's saying, you better do something, because if you don't, you're going to go to the next step, and it's going to be a red light. Resentment leads eventually to bitterness. And bitterness is when it gets dangerous. What happens when bitterness starts to take root, and that's what the scriptural way of describing it. See to it that no one fail to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness spring up and cause trouble and by it and many become defiled. So, bitterness is like this poisonous plant that, that takes root and it produces this fruit that just starts hurting everything around it. It defiles many. The key thing here is that when bitterness is, when you've gotten to the point of bitterness, even though maybe somebody else's offense is what fed it, now it's your problem. If you, get, if you become bitter, unfortunately, that's your responsibility because you have not tended to your anger properly. But it's really, really hard for people who are bitter to see that, that they have responsibility. Why? Because what are, they, what, are they, what are they thinking? They're thinking, I'm bitter because you have done this over and over and over and over again. It's so easy to keep pointing out and blame the other one. And so people won't take, they won't take ownership of the bitterness that they have. And it's difficult to, to, to root it out for that reason. It can be done, but the further down this progression you get, the harder it is to come back. Bitterness leads to contempt. Contempt is the lens of bitterness. So contempt is this, when I become bitter, now I have this lens through which I view you. And it's a, it's a, I look down on you, I despise you. And again, it can be really subtle, but now it doesn't matter, I keep looking at Connor, poor Connor. So let's say Connor, I should be looking at Everett, since he's the guy I'm going to get mad. <laughs> so, it's, contempt is, is, I just see you through this warped lens, and now there's nothing you can do that, that looks good. 
It would be the neutral thing is, I go, eh. I still get this, eh. And even when he does good, if you're bitter and you have contempt, even when the person tries or they, or they do something good in your heart, you're like, oh, they're only doing that because blah, 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 blah. I write it off. I don't give credit for anything. And so it just poisons my view of this person. And there's nothing they can do at that point. It's me that's, that's now ruining the relationship. Contempt leads to hatred, and finally hatred leads to death. Sometimes literally, you know, a poison in the tea. <laughs> um, seriously, in history. But it, death in the sense of the death of the relationship, or just it just starts touching everything. and Life just doesn't go well. It does not lead to thriving, particularly in the relationship. So this is what happens when anger goes untended. So, let's say, though, you admit... This is all that happens in step one where you just don't admit you're angry, <laughs> okay? It leads to all this bad stuff. All right, now you admit, all right, I'm angry. That leads to question two. Why am I angry? Now you're trying to get at the, the problem, okay? You're trying to look beyond the pain to the problem. Why am I angry? So this has like two parts to it. First, you want to identify what you believe is the harm, actually. What you believe, and again, I'm speaking more in relational terms, you know, if you know, if you fall down and skin your knee, I'm not talking about trying to figure out what the universe is trying to do to you. I'm talking about really between people that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you want to ask yourself, what is the harm that was done? What, did this, what do I think that this person did? It's very important that you recognize this is your take on it. Why? Because, number two, the next thing you need to do is you need to figure out whether your take is right. All right. So um, this is where it's really crucial for us to admit or have it firmly in our heads that um, our emotions, again, like I said before, are really great at telling us that there's a problem, but they're really awful at giving an accurate description of the problem. You need to, you need to, frankly, you ought to assume that probably your take isn't quite right. I, you should really assume that. I, and it, I'm not saying you haven't been harmed and you haven't been hurt. You probably have. Probably. We're going to look at that too. There's a chance you weren't. But you, you need to be self-critical. And by the way, for all of this stuff, I have to say, we need help with this. This isn't, you know, we Americans love to just sit alone by ourselves and figure all this out. You might need to have a trusted friend. If it's safe, maybe you're actually having this conversation with the person that you feel wounded you. But you might have to have this conversation with somebody else with the purpose of, I want to go to this one. I want to make sure. I want to look at myself first. I want to make sure I'm getting this straight in my own head. But we need, we need the help of one another. We need the help of the Holy Spirit, the community. We need the people of God, we need the Spirit of God, we need the Word of God to move forward in these things. It's not easy. And it's really hard to do it all by yourself. Because I want to view, you know, we get all lost in our heads and stuff. So, as you're doing it, you're, you're trying to determine whether or not you're mistaken. And that's because, again, we have the problem of faulty gauges. Our emotions are very faulty. Uh, so, I don't know, you all have this particular gauge in your cars. Um, the old check engine light, right? My truck, like every three or four months, that little light goes off. And when it first used to do it, of course, well, still, even though I know what it usually means, when it goes off, you know, my heart skips a beat, right? Oh, no, check engine. You know, that's like the scariest light to go on. That means my engine's going to blow up in the next five miles. And you're, you're kind of freaking out. Well, with my truck, it always turns out to be that stupid evaporative, this, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It just means my gas cap is not turned on tight. That's all it really means. Check engine. And I just put the gas, gas cap on there. Which is really annoying. But, okay, so technically there's a problem. But it's not really a big deal. Right? The other day, about a month ago, I had another light go on that told me my, my rear tail lights were messed up. And I was like, out there looking. They're fine. And so I, you know, I got one of those little things where you can plug it in and check your codes and I'm clearing codes all the time. One of these days, you know, my engine will blow up because I don't know how to read the codes, but that's another problem. So, our gauges go off, but we need to um, make sure 
We need to, we need to check for accuracy. So we're going to end up with three possibilities. One is I find out no harm was done. I was mistaken. I, I, I just was wrong. Like an example of this was back when I was, again, back in our 20s. Uh, uh, yeah. No, it was probably our early 30s. <laughs> Back when I was just starting to get in touch with the fact that I get angry. In fact, this was the thing that got me in touch with, oh, I get angry. The particular thing, LaShawn and I had just gone through our marriage, some, some of the prior most difficult times in our marriage, and she was kind of a few steps ahead of me on that. I was catching up, and I realized, kind of a long story, oh, I have anger. And the thing I had anger over was, I hate sharing this, um, was... I had thought, up to that point, you know, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty phenomenal husband and father. <laughs> uh, my dad, Mexican, uh, you know, his, his cultural heritage, uh, which is very kind of, um, you know, dad, the dads in, in the home, they don't do a whole lot of the parenting stuff. Like, he didn't change any diapers, okay? He didn't do any of that kind of thing. He was king of the castle. Well, I was a 90s guy, you know, I, I don't, I'm not doing that male chauvinistic stuff. I'm in there changing diapers and being a good guy. But I, what I realized was a piece of me that was like, I'm way better than my dad. And I'm not really getting the appreciation I deserve for that. <laughs> like, I think I'm pretty awesome. I'm not demanding to be the king of the castle. So is it, is it the do I should receive being treated like the king of the castle? I mean, really, that's, when I really uncovered it, I realized that's how I was thinking. And so I had this anger inside that I wasn't getting more kudos for basically doing what a dad just should do. And, and when I first realized it and voiced it, it turns out what I was angry about, I wasn't, there was no wrong being done to me. It was, I had an expectation that was mistaken. It, it turned around, and that's part of what this examination process is meant to do. Invariably in our relationships, it's, there's going to be two sides of the coin. There's going to be two things going on. Even if you have truly been wronged, there's probably stuff going on on your side that you need to uncover. And in this case, she didn't do anything. That's probably could have, you know, maybe, I don't know, expressed a little appreciation, but for changes, no. <laughs> no. It was my issue, okay? It was my issue. Secondly, harm was done, but my anger is magnifying. This one is probably the most common, the most... You, look, unless you're Jesus, and I don't think any of us sitting here are Jesus, like, I think you should just assume you're doing this. If, if you get wrong, and you have a feeling of anger, I, it's best to just assume your anger is probably, like the offense is at a five, let's say, your anger is probably at least at a six if not a seven or an eight or a nine. It's almost always jacked up a little higher than is appropriate to the offense. And this is important that we realize that this becomes the law in our own mind. You may, in a sense, be justified for feeling angry, but as we're going to see in a minute, if you live from that anger and it's up here, this is what the beginning of a feud is. You know, it's... You look cross-eyed at my dog, and then I kicked your pig, and then you shot my goat, and then I, in the end, you know, you're shooting children and stuff, and you got the hat fills in the reports, because it just keeps escalating, because it's like, I feel like, even though you just looked funny at my dog, it felt like you kicked my pig, so I'm going to go kick your pig, which feels to them like you just shot my goat, so they go shoot your goat, you know, and it just goes up and up and up, leads to destruction, so... You've got to get the truth question. What actually happened? And really, really get a look at that. So let's say you do that, and, and you, well, so let's say you recognize, you know, you've done all these steps, and it turns out harmless stuff, and now you have an accurate view of actually how this offense, whatever it was that the person did, problem was found. Now you get to the point of response. And here's where we kind of end today in this Having done all that, and that's a whole bunch of stuff right there. Now you get to the place of what are you going to do? Somebody's done something. Um, how do you respond to the, to the problem behind this pain, to the actual hurt? And here you're faced with a huge choice. You have a choice, and this has to do with that other extreme, whether you're going to like live from the pain, or are you going to do 
for you to do the healthy thing, and that is to live out of grace and truth. Your choice is between grace and truth or putting anger. Which of these is going to be, are you going to put in control of your response? This is, the, this is huge. This actually has to go through the whole process, but it's especially important at this point. In John 1, it says, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law, right and wrong. Our anger is based in law. It's law-based. It's injustices. And the law is good. Your anger is saying something happened that should not have happened. It's the truth of that. It's what gets us in trouble. But there's a bigger truth. And here's one thing I want to really impress on you as I describe grace and truth versus anger. I could just sort of spiritualize on you and say, you should just do grace and truth because that's the Jesus way and it's so beautiful and da 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 try to motivate it like that. I just want to say to you in very pragmatic terms, just practically speaking, to put anger in control just does not work. The why behind that is that if I... It's like, you offended me, I'm angry. If you look at it, um, you know, it's kind of what I described earlier. When it's in control, it's like, you did me wrong. I'm, I'm not justified, and so I come at you. It's like, you owe me. And my, my anger is justified, and so I'm going to be angry at you. Something in us tells us that if I just, if I kind of vent my anger or act from my anger, that's going to satisfy it. I'm going to find satisfaction. We call it justice. But what ends up happening when you come at someone in anger is they're going to have one of these three responses. They're either going to get angry back. <laughs> that's a feud. In other words, you come at them from anger, guess what? They're going to get defensive. You're probably going to overstate your case. If you're coming out of your anger, they're going to find every mistake of what you said. Zero one on that. Now they feel like an injustice. You're acu- I only stole five dollars from you. You're accusing me of stealing a hundred dollars. You're wrong. And they're ignoring the fact that they stole from you, but you're over accusing them. And no, 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 no. Or you're very successful at piling shame on them. You shame them out of your anger, and they're the kind of person that takes the shame, and you get them to conform. Out of shame. And we're going to see next week that is not a good, that's not love. That's not a good motivation to, to do. That's not what you really want. To shame people into treating you right. Yeah, that's not really what you're looking for. You want them to love you because they love you. Right? So, and then finally, the pain of fear is the person who responds by her own. You're angry. You're scary. I'm keeping my distance from you because you're not safe. Because you just come at me. In, in, in this anger thing, you're trouble. So keep your distance. All of these break down relationship. What we want, you know, put away falsehood, speak truth to another, we are members one of another. We can't have harmony in our human homes, human families, our Christian family, with our neighbors, whatever, if we act from anger. It just doesn't work. It creates more pain, more suffering. A mess. Instead, we live, we're called to live out of grace and truth. So grace is a posture. We know that the, the technical definition of grace is undeserved mercy. There's that word deserve. It takes the deserve out of the equation. It's ceasing to live by justice and say, I deserve, you know, you deserve now to pay for this. It takes that and sets it aside. It says the posture, I'm not going to take that posture. What I find to be the, the um, a, a, a better, not a better, but a good definition of grace is uh, I'm for you. I'm for you. So, truth is the part, by the way, it has to be grace and truth. Grace without truth is, is mush, it's codependency, it's only before you, and we're not going to address the problem. Like, you, you hurt me, you wronged me. We won't talk about that. I'm just going to be nice to you. That's not real grace. That's grace without truth. It doesn't get at the problem. Truth without grace is, is basically weaponized truth. It's I'm going to use every truth I can get my hands on out of my anger 
to get you. Grace is a posture that says, I am for you. I am for you. So what, what happens with, with grace and truth is, or we get these two together, is anger fuses the person with the act that they did. Anger says, what you did is you, and, I'm, and so I am against you. It sees you as against me. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm out against you. Grace and truth allows us to separate the person from what they did and say, I'm for you, but I'm against what you did. But because I'm for you, we can talk about it. We can talk about it. Um, that's how that goes. So, uh, real quick as we end, I told you we were going to go a little longer, so thank you for your patience for that. But we're wrapping up here. Just to illustrate this, I told you I got mad at effort. Um, here's what I, it's not it wasn't a big thing, but it's a good illustration. And again, I'm glad it's kind of a smaller thing because I, th I think much of our lives with each other has lived in the smaller stuff. I can tell some grand story of rage, but, and this would apply to that too, but I think most of us live with the little things. And so uh, a week and a half ago at staff meeting, um, Everett likes to tease, okay? He likes to tease. And I didn't grow up being teased or teasing, there's no teasing in my friend. I don't know what to do with the teasing, but he likes to sometimes tease me. And he started doing that at, at the staff meeting about this particular thing we were talking about. And something in me was just annoying. And so I kind of ratcheted it up and, you know, hit back a little bit. And then he went up and, and this sitting in front of everybody at staff too. And, and I, on reflection later, I mean, in the moment, it just kind of went, boop, 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 boop. And um, in the end, of course, you know, I got the last word because he's smart enough to know, you know, <laughs> don't keep this up. You know, finally stop. But, but it didn't bug me. I was, I was, I was a little ticked. I was like, this is, this is a practice talking to me like this for, you know. <laughs> um, but we're, we, I, afterwards, I was kind of, I don't know who brought it up here with Sean, but started talking about it. And Sean goes, she goes, yeah, Dave. She goes, I. I like so many things about you. I really admire you. If that's one thing about you, I just don't like. <laughs> when, when you get like that. Um, and it's just pure ego. It's just, it's pride. It was just this pride and not. But, so there it was. And then a couple of days later, Everett and I were together doing some other things. And so I brought it up. And, but... The nature of the discussion, having gone through these steps, obviously I have these things on my mind. Having gone through this and thought, I mean, Everett always shows me respect. And my anger told me lies like, he's dissing me, you know, like, like he's against me. I, I you don't consciously think, I don't, you know, Everett's against me, but emotionally it just feels like, this guy's trying to make me look bad, hey, what's he doing this for? But upon conscious reflection, like, he... He, both, both these guys always show great respect to me and Caleb and Sean, Becky. And so to believe that, to take a stance of opposition is just a lie. And instead it was like, we just had this great conversation where I just expressed how I felt, tried to figure out why he likes to do this easy thing anyway. You know, he was like, hell, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to draw out that side of you. So, you know, we, we identified the problems. He's still thinking about his side. Like, he still doesn't even know why he does it. I'm curious to find out if he figured that out. But, um, but it was a great conversation, a conversation in which we were both for one another. And then we, because we were for one another, we were able to get at the truth of the matter and walk away from it feeling actually closer, feeling mutual respect. It was fine. It was good. Um, small example, but these things get repeated over and over and over and over again. It, 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 all of this depends, all of this goes back to the gospel. And the need for, to be able to forgive. Here's Jesus hanging on the cross, having suffered the greatest injustice ever. An innocent man dying. And he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. In the Lord's Prayer, he says, we're told to say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The only 
Forgiveness is the key to be able to move from a stance of anger to a, I'm for you. It's difficult. It may not happen overnight. It's something we need to walk with each other. But again, not only are we called to it, not only is it beautiful, but if I could just appeal to your self-interest, it's really the only thing that works. To choose the other is to choose death. It, it, your sense of justice just screams, no, forgiving means letting them off the hook. I won't get satisfaction. I can just, we all know when we forgive, now I can come at this person as I'm for you. But we're going to talk about this problem. We are going to talk about this problem. That's the way. That's the way. And that, and that is the only way that is made possible by Christ. Not just as an example, but by His Spirit. And if anything you need to do that to help you is just to contemplate about how much you've been forgiven. It's a lot easier to forgive others when you realize how much I've been forgiven. It's easier to show mercy to others. Thanks for sticking with it for this long. Next week we, you know, we're just going to do shame. And you're going to see, not, we're not just going to talk about shame, but shame and anger have a way of running up against each other and making each other worse. So it's an interesting sort of a, mainly shame, but... These two interface with each other. Shame is an interesting one. It's different. You will see. Very controversial subject, shame. Um, let's pray and sing our doxology. Father God, thank you for this time. God, help us with our emotions. Thank you that you've given us something that tells us when something's wrong. But Lord, it's not a pleasant feeling. We don't like it. Help us to help each other. To speak truth to ourselves first. And as needed, speak truth to our neighbor. Help us to be people of the truth, but also help us to be people of grace. Help us to move from a place of being postured against or feeling like others are against us to getting to a place where we are for one another, even the one who's hurt us. We need your help to be able to do that. Help us in our relationships, God. We want to be like your son. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.